People in the developing world suffer and die from foodborne illnesses at rates far higher than anyone else. That disparity is so enormous, so glaring, that it shines right through the fog that obscures what relatively minor differences may exist between highly developed nations. People in Europe, for example, are fully convinced that we here in the United States suffer from foodborne illness at rates far higher than they do. But despite what you may have heard, despite what stats people might have quoted to you, we do not know if that is true. National estimates about food poisoning are compiled by health authorities in their respective nations, and those authorities use radically different methodologies to arrive at their figures. The result is apples and oranges numbers that cannot be compared, and there is good reason to believe that the numbers here in the United States are inflated. But even just exploring that question is probably a distraction from the much clearer and more important truth of children in the global south suffering and dying from stomach bugs that would pose a mere inconvenience to someone like me. There exists one comprehensive, unified attempt to quantify the problem of foodborne illness on a global scale, and this is it. This 2015 report from the World Health Organization. Scientists from all over the world collaborated for nearly a decade to find apples-to-apples -apples numbers about who gets sick from what and where, and here's one of those scientists, Dr. Ari Havilar. He used to study food safety at the Dutch Public Health Agency, he's from the Netherlands, now he's here in the U.S at the University of Florida. When you look at, at, at football disease statistics um, that are reported, uh, there is always, um, we, we call it the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I mean, you have to realize that, uh, for example, if you suffer from football diarrhea, uh, you're a young, healthy person, so you may not even go to the doctor. The vast majority of foodborne illnesses go entirely unreported. I mean, think about it. How many times in your life have you gotten diarrhea or the throw-ups? Now, of those times, how many times did you go to the doctor? Now, of those times that you went to the doctor, how many times did you get laboratory-confirmed results confirming precisely what pathogen was responsible for your sickness? Now, of those times, how many times did public health officials get involved and conclusively trace your infection back to this one guy with norovirus who was making salad for the buffet line? Most people who get a foodborne illness assume it was the last thing they ate that did it, but that is very often not the case. Foodborne pathogens have incubation periods. It can be hours, days, even weeks before something bad you ate actually starts making you sick. So most times, you'll never know what did it. This is what makes foodborne illness so hard for scientists to quantify. They have to look at the very small number of laboratory-confirmed cases and then use statistical modeling to extrapolate what the rest of the iceberg looks like. And that model is going to be different for every nation. For example, people who live in countries with robust universal healthcare systems are a lot more likely to get a laboratory diagnosis than people who live in countries where they can't always afford to go to the doctor for something like diarrhea. You know, third world hell holes like the United States. Furthermore, disparities in healthcare quality and availability amplify the consequences of infections that may be caused by disparities in the safety of the food supply. These are some maps I knocked together with data Dr. Havilar sent me. These show those estimates from the WHO report published in 2015, and they show cases from the year 2010, the most recent year available. The most localized data available is for the WHO subregions, which divide the world into 14 territories. They have country-by-country -country data, but the WHO member nations have not consented to its release, so we have to make do with these numbers that have been aggregated up to the sub-regional level. Remember when you look at these maps, you're not looking at data for your country, you're looking at data for your country's region, and there's 14 regions in the world. So they're pretty big, these regions. This is the kind of deeper context that we all need to understand the news that we read every day. And I've been getting most of my news lately from the sponsor of this video, Morning Brew, whom I'll now briefly thank. I'll show you those maps in a sec. Morning Brew is a free daily newsletter that you can wake up with Mondays through Saturdays. Instead of aimlessly scrolling through social media trying to piece together what's happening in the world based on whatever your friends are gabbing about, you can start your day with a tight, smart summary of world events that respects your intelligence and your time. I, of course, read this morning about the horrific harbor explosion in Beirut. There's a million things on the internet about this tragedy 
right now, but look at how Morning Brew breaks it down for you. Here's the human toll, the most important thing right at the top. Here's the current best guess as to why it happened. Not wild speculation, it's based on public records obtained by real reporters. And then here's what you can do about it. Morning Brew is always connecting what's happening in the world with you and your life. If you're interested in global affairs, politics, business, finance, tech, there's no reason to not subscribe to Morning Brew. It's free and it takes 15 seconds to sign up if you hit my link in the description. You'll be doing us both a favor. Thank you, Morning Brew. Now, maps. Here's the rate of foodborne illnesses per 100,000 people in the America B region. That's places like Mexico, Brazil, Argentina. The estimated rate of illness there is actually a little higher than the rate in the Africa D region. That's West Africa. That's when we look at rates of foodborne illnesses. When we look at the rate of deaths from foodborne illnesses, that rate in West Africa is 17 times the rate in the Latin America B region. And the death rate in the U.S. US and Canada region is less than half of the one in Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina and the like. The death disparity is way bigger than the illness disparity. Why? Obviously, uh, children in the United States have a much smaller chance of dying from a foodborne disease, from a diarrheal disease in general, than children in Africa. Partly because of the healthcare system, but also because children in Africa often have multiple uh, disease conditions. They may suffer from malaria, from other diseases that also increases their risk of, of dying. Another reason for the illness map looking so different from the deaths map may be the specific kinds of illnesses that people are getting. All around the world, the number one foodborne disease is norovirus. And norovirus usually just gives you a really bad time, but it does kill some people. Salmonella is a lot more lethal. Other things are rarely lethal, but terrible in their own ways. A big one in Latin America, for example, is pork tapeworm. Tapeworms don't kill a lot of people. The main thing they do is cause epilepsy in kids, also blindness. Some foodborne diseases kill you, some debilitate you for life, and some just cause you to spend one miserable evening on the floor of your bathroom. And because of those differences, Dr. Havilar and his colleagues think the illness and death rates are bad ways of quantifying this problem. That's why I had to make these maps from their data. They didn't put maps like these in their report, and I think Dr. Havilar is a little miffed at me for even showing them to you. It's his opinion, and I'm sure he's right, that the better metric to look at is this one. Dollies, Disability Adjusted Life Years Lost. What this map is showing you is how many years of healthy living people lost to foodborne diseases in these regions. So India and Bangladesh and neighboring countries over here lost a combined 711 years of healthy life per 100,000 people in 2010, or at least that is the best guess estimate. The disparities on the map are even more stark when you look at them in bar chart form. This is a page from that WHO report, and remember these are all per capita numbers, rates per 100,000 people in the region. This teeny little stub over here, this is the Western Pacific A region, highly developed countries like Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, and these two towers next door are the Southern and Southeast Asia regions, Indonesia, Asia, India, Thailand, etc. These are the Middle Eastern regions over here. Next door, you've got the America D region. That's some of the poorer Latin American countries. And then over here, these two towers in the stratosphere, these are the African regions. This is where the problem really is, and this is clearly where the world's focus should be as it relates to foodborne illness. Now, for the rest of this video, I'm gonna talk about the relatively minor differences between rich countries. Not because I think those are more important, I don't. I'm gonna talk about them because I know that you, my viewers, talk about those differences a lot, and I want to inform your conversations with the available facts. Here's the America A region, that's the US, Canada, and Cuba. Over here is the Europe A region, that's Western Europe. According to these best guess figures from the World Health Organization, Northern America and Western Europe are in a statistical tie when it comes to foodborne illness. And that holds true whether you look at disability-adjusted life years, illnesses, or deaths. Why is this so different from what so many Europeans believe? Every time I talk here or on my TikTok about food safety, I'm flooded with European commenters who believe that the American rate of food poisoning is sky high compared to their own. European food is pure and natural, while American food is dirty, industrialized, pumped with chemicals, and it's killing Americans left and right. 
or so goes the stereotype. And this stereotype is front and center in the UK's public discourse right now as of this recording. The UK has just left the European Union, and as a result, the Brits and the Americans now have to negotiate a new trade deal between them. A lot of Brits are worried that if they want to be able to sell their stuff to us Americans without huge tariffs, then they might have to agree to let us sell our stuff over there. Things like food products from the United States that would have been effectively blocked under the old EU trade deal. The emblematic example in UK media right now is chlorinated chicken. Some American chicken processors use a chlorine rinse or spray to kill surface bacteria on the birds. This practice has been banned in the EU since 1997, despite the fact that the European Food Safety Authority determined in 2005 that chlorine rinses are perfectly safe. Whether the UK is going to have to accept imports of chlorinated American chicken under a post-Brexit trade deal is a question that is provoking outright hysteria in the UK right now, despite the fact that only 5% of US chicken processors even do this, according to estimates from the National Chicken Council. In defense of the Brits, this isn't really about chlorinated chicken, it's about what it represents. A difference that I note is that in Europe there's a tendency to control problems more in primary production, whereas here, whereas here in the US it's more controlled during processing, which may be less effective. When he says primary production, Dr. Havilar is talking about better animal welfare standards, for example, not raising animals in such tight spaces that they can spread disease to each other. And, and in the US, for example, uh, there's more dependence on chemical uh, disinfection of meat and, and meat products, which is simply not accepted by consumers in, uh, in Europe. So there's definitely a legitimate argument to be made about U.S. food standards. But is this a legitimate claim? The rate of foodborne illness is 10 times higher in the U.S. than the U.K.? Is that really true? That is a claim that is simply accepted as fact in the U.K. right now. Politicians say it, TV news presenters say it, everybody thinks it's true, and it might not be. According to this study from the UK Food Standards Agency, about 1 in 28 UK residents suffered a foodborne illness in the year 2018. The Center for Disease Control in the US estimates that rate to be 1 in 6 among US residents. 1 in 6 people getting sick from food every year in the US. But what we have there is two different agencies using two different methodologies to come up with their respective numbers. I'll give you an example. Norovirus, of course, is the biggest foodborne illness in both countries. But but people get norovirus lots of ways, not just from food. You can get it from water, you can get it from touching contaminated surfaces, you can get it through direct contact with an infected person. To come up with their foodborne illness estimates, the CDC assumes that 26% of norovirus cases are foodborne. When the UK calculates their estimates, they assume that a much smaller percentage of norovirus cases are foodborne. That's just one example of how the US and the UK numbers don't really jive. There are more. If you want to read about them, check out this report just released a couple of weeks ago by the UK Food Standards Agency. Their conclusion, attempting to accurately compare different countries' foodborne disease rates is an almost impossible task. It's probably the case that the numbers in the US are smaller than they actually look. The US is very aggressive generally about tracking foodborne illness, some might say paranoid. Why that is, is a conversation for another day. For now, the best guess we have is these regional numbers I showed you before, and these maps of mine are linked in the description along with the WHO report the data comes from and all of the associated scientific papers by Dr. Havilar and colleagues. But let me reiterate one more time, this is the best guess. I am not telling you that the foodborne illness rates in the US and the UK are the same. I'm telling you that we don't know. What we do know is that the problem is way worse in the global south, so let's keep our focus where it really belongs.